So today's webinar, Silvopasturing, a solution to some 21st century challenges on rural landscapes, is made possible through forestry and natural resource webinars, a partnership with the North Carolina State University Cooperative Extension, Southern Regional Extension Forestry, and the Texas A&M Forest Service. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Brett Chedzoy. Brett is a senior resource educator in natural resources and agriculture with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Schuyler County, County New York. Brett first became involved with silver patch, patch, pasture management while working as a forester in the early 1990s in central Argentina. Upon returning to New York in 2002, Brett began to implement silver pasture management at the family farm in New York's Finger Lake region, Angus Glen Farms. Since 2008, Brett has delivered dozens of talks and workshops related to silver pasture management. Brett? Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're out in the West Coast. Sean, I assume you can hear me all right? Sounds good. Okay. Very good. Um, let's get started then. So the title of today's talk is Civil Pasturing, a Solution to Some 21st Century Challenges on Rural Landscapes. We should start with a simple definition. I there's a lot of definitions out there for the different ag agroforestry systems. I think of civil pasturing as the sustainable production of timber, forages, and livestock on the same land. And the key word there, of course, is sustainable, meaning that we're not just throwing animals into the woods until we can get around to clearing all the timber and convert it to open pasture land, nor are we uh, growing so much timber on the land that there's not enough sunlight to grow quality forages for the livestock. That's to say no single resource is being managed to, at the detriment of one of the other resources. This is a slide that I borrowed from Dr. Dusty Walter from the Center for Agroforestry at University of Missouri and I like it because it illustrates the uniqueness of civil pasturing compared to some of the other major agroforestry systems where we have this intersection of silviculture, forage sciences, and animal husbandry. Um, and that, that intersection is what we would think of as civil pasturing. And in pretty much any region in which we can grow trees, we can approach civil pasturing from either of these two directions. We can be adding woods into our pasture land or our grazing land, or we can be adding pasture into our woodlands. But regardless of which direction we approach it from, the goal is that that image that was in the middle of the previous slide, which is this uh, symbiotic system that is synergistic. That's to say that the trees, the livestock, and the other plants are working together for a system where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And, and again, it's key that this is done in a way that even though it's these are going to be dynamic systems that change in appearance over time, we're doing it in a way that we can, over the long term, be producing both quality timber and quality grazing for livestock. Uh, we started formally talking about civil pasturing here about six years ago in upstate New York and in the Northeast and have found a lot of interest in this topic. Um, I'll talk about the old paradigm in a minute of keeping animals out of the woods, at least here in the Northeast, and, and that was good advice at that time. Uh, much has changed since then, and of course we have to continue to evolve our, our uh, land management tools to, to keep up with the times. But I put this slide on there just to show that civil pasturing, although still uh, uncommon and somewhat taboo in the Northeast, it is a common agroforestry system or management system in many other parts of the world. My experience with civil pasturing, as Sean said, started back in the early 1990s. I was in the U.S. Peace Corps and worked in central Argentina with a number of uh, innovative ranchers who were also foresters by education and background. And they found that by introducing fast-growing trees like slash and loblolly pine, 
into their native rangelands that they could uh, both rehabilitate the land and get um, other benefits such as better performance out of their livestock and create a valuable timber resource. Much of Argentina is deficient in timber. They, they have a joke there that God gave them great soils and climate and then he forgot to put the trees there. So these friends of mine spent um, about 15 years prior to my arrival aforesting a lot of these native rangelands, which actually are quite high in rainfall, about 40 inches a year, but because of the degraded soils and the structure of the um, soils, a lot of the rainfall is not not captured, doesn't infiltrate, it, it runs off in flash flooding. Now with the pines there, they're getting a lot more organic matter in the soil, a transition to more broadleaf and cool season forages. And as you can see there, the cows are enjoying the, the light shade. This, this is actually a picture from our ranch in Argentina. Uh, my wife is from central Argentina in Cordoba, and we bought this ranch when we were married in 1994. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So when our family moved back to the family farm in upstate New York in Watkins Glen, New York, in 2002, I started looking around to see if anything had changed for the better in our woods and found the same old problem still persisted. We had heavy understories of what foresters refer to as interfering vegetation. We had beech brush, we had ironwood, we had uh, dense invasive shrub thickets in our understory, and that lower uh, picture in the right hand corner there, that's a bouquet of just about every invasive plant that grows in upstate New York and there it is in one small little corner of our farm. We have multiflora rose, oriental bittersweet, uh, privet, European buckthorn, I think there's some honeysuckle mixed in there and I know there was some barberry in that picture as well. So we knew that the problem wasn't going to magically go away by itself and having worked um, at that point for quite a few years in Argentina, I became more comfortable with the idea of combining timber production with uh, livestock grazing and we brought in a machine like this one, the picture, this is a FECON but we also use machines like a timber, timber axe and a hydro axe to knock a lot of this dense brush down. If I go back to the previous slide here in the lower right hand corner, you can see that, that a lot of that uh, invasive understory or interfering understory is well above the reach of cattle or sheep or goats and so they need a little help to get started and consequently we brought this machine in here and, and mowed about 80 acres of forest understory. The advantage of the FECON is it's, a, it's an agile machine that can work around field stone and kind of uh, other obstacles at the, at the ground surface. But as everybody I'm sure is, that's tuned in today realizes if you go and clear a noxious invasive thicket of brush it's going to just grow back and it's probably going to grow back even worse than it was before. So we started experimenting with ways to utilize our um, different livestock on the farm. At that time we had fairly large uh, flocks of hair sheep as well as a, a band of about 40 um, does, meat goats, and we're building our cattle herd simultaneously. And you can see the goats here in the area that was mowed and you can see all the things on the ground uh, they're trying to grow back. All the little coppice or stump sprouts from all the shrubs that were mowed as well as other things that were, were germinating from the seed bank. And here's the same, same area, it's a different angle about uh, six years later, uh, I guess eight years later, and you can see that through um, intensively matched grazing we've been able to transition it over to uh, kind of a cool season grass understory mixed with other forbs that 
uh, here the cows are enjoying it and on a hot summer day. So I started to mention this earlier, and for probably the past 70 years in the Northeast, we've had this uh, very effective paradigm of keeping animals out of the woods, and that's because pretty much all of our little farms on the landscape were either family dairy farms or family livestock farms where the woodlot became the place where animals were turned out to loaf either between milkings or uh, they had pretty much unmanaged continual access to these wooded farm woodlot areas to get out of the heat, escape the biting flies, go in and forage for whatever they could get out of it. And years and years of that type of uh, use of farm, farm woodlands resulted in problems that are illustrated in these pictures below here, uh, eroding hillsides, dieback or um, decline in the health of the timber, uh, in, in, in kind of extreme cases, uh, soil compaction, girdling of valuable timber trees, but obviously another issue was the um, decline or absence of natural regeneration. And whereas natural regeneration was impeded by continual livestock grazing half a century ago, today of course um, we have a, a new challenge even though livestock is not the root cause of the, the absence of desirable natural regeneration. We have these, uh, again, this proliferation of aggressive uh, non-native plants, or in some cases native plants, the, this, these uh, plant communities that interfere with our management objectives and, and with silvicultural objectives such as establishing quality natural regeneration. Um, so I also said earlier that things have changed though over the past half century or more, and today we have tools at our disposal as civil pasture practitioners or foresters or um, grazers that our, our, our forefathers did not. We, we understand management intensive grazing practices and principles uh, much better um, than the old set stock grazing of, of half a century ago. And we also have uh, things such as white impedance fence chargers and portable fencing systems that we can use to keep animals where we want them for the period of time that we want them. I th put this slide in here so that you can, uh, this, this is kind of how we got started on talking about civil pasturing here in, in upstate New York. Uh, Peter Smolich, who's our state extension forester, and I believe he's on the webinar, and another friend of mine, Dr. Tatiana Stanton, who's one of our state small ruminant specialists, did a three-year study at Cornell's Arnott Forest to look at the effectiveness of using goats to control these interfering understories. And it, it, the, the initial focus was in the sugar bush area of the Arnott Forest. For, for you, those of you that don't um, understand what sugar bush is, that's, that's a sugar maple woods that's used to make maple syrup. And you can see uh, kind of an electrified net fence going down through the middle there. They, they made small paddocks and essentially did what we would think of as mob grazing in wooded areas. And you can see kind of the before and after pictures. So high densities of goats applied to a small area for a short period of time. And the goats were uh, managed in a way that enticed them to aggressively defoliate and even uh, girdle the small diameter stems. And the target vegetation here was striped maple, beech brush, and ironwood. If you're interested in the re results of that study, they're archived on Peter's forestry extension website, which I'll have the link to that at the end of this presentation. But the, the bottom line was that, that intensely managed livestock could be effective to control the, this vegetation and do it in, in an organic fashion. Uh, another thing that's changed in, in recent years, and, and I'll speak in the context of upstate New York <coughs> or the Northeast, but uh, I think many other parts of the country are in a similar situation. 
I'm sorry, I had to have a sip of water, is that we now have the opportunities to go in and do aggressive thinnings of low-grade wood. And this has always been a struggle for us in this area. We've, we've always had strong tr markets for uh, quality saw timber, but it's always been hard to get rid of the, the weed-type trees or the low-quality trees. And if you look at a typical woodlot here in upstate New York, um, well over half the stocking on average would be considered low-quality low timber, firewood-type timber. And um, these are even aged forests, and those low-quality trees are never going to uh, amount to anything really beyond low quality trees. So I think of civil pasturing really as a choice between growing firewood or growing forage. We can either leave all those low quality trees there behind or we can harvest them out and manage for higher sunlight levels at the ground to grow forage to graze our livestock. Uh, any of you that have traveled outside the United States realizes that much of the rest of the world does not manage their land the same as we do here. And having uh, woodlots set aside and really just is the place where you grow some timber and you maybe hunt deer in the fall is, is a bit of a luxury. But I think that with uh, growing challenges to, to feed ourselves both at a global and local scale that we're going to be looking to use uh, more and more of our, our rural land acreage to its highest and best use. Um, and I think that uh, the, the growth in the, the local foods movement is, is also going to drive how we can utilize uh, more of our um, less productive woodlands or reverting agricultural land that has timber growing on it to, to help produce this uh, food for the local food shed. And finally, uh, these are kind of a list of things that have also changed in recent decades. And it's we should always be reminded that there's many negative forces constantly being exerted upon our, our woodlands and our trees. And soil pasturing, I see, as a tool to help counter some of these, these uh, negative influences or threats. Here in the, much of the Northeast, we're continuously struggling with um, excessive herbivory by, by deer. Uh, many of our woodlands have been mismanaged or what, what foresters would call high graded, where the best timber is removed and the uh, timber with, with low future potential is, is left behind. We have a proliferation of invasive pests here in New York State. We're being surrounded by emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, and um, I doubt those will be the worst pest threats that we, we see in the coming years. Hopefully no Asian longhorn beetle, but time will tell. And then, of course, this interfering vegetation. Interfering meaning that, again, it's, it's, it's a barrier to our, our management objectives for our land. And it can be native or non-native plants. This is a picture of a friend's woodlot with uh, about an eight-foot high impenetrable understory of multiflora rose. And he's tried to spray it along the front edge there. You can tell it's dead, but the back part of it's still alive and well. And he's now in the process of clearing that rose through mowing and excavation and um, probably a combination of other tools like like spraying. And then we'll use his, uh, he has 600 hair sheep ewes that he'll use to um, intensively graze that and, and shift it more towards uh, a, a quality silvo pasture system. Now, uh, I always like whenever I have foresters on the uh, listening to one of my talks, and, and I'm a forester. I'd like to point out that I'm not talking about converting all of our forest land wherever you live in the country, or even all of our grass grasslands to these savanna-like uh, silvo pasture areas. Um, you know, there's, there's, first of all, I guess I should say that there's lots of acreage out there that will never be suitable for civil pasturing, but um, that 
this this is not meaning that it's uh, uh, um, going to be a shift in losing valuable grasslands or valuable deep forest land to, to civil pasturing. But if you look at at least here in the Northeast, but really much of our uh, forest land throughout the country in a historical context, th this is nothing new. Our, our ancestors, again, they they had to make a living from the land and uh, just carving or putting fence up around the woods and saying, there, that's my woodlot, and I'm just going to cut some firewood and a little timber out of there and you know, go out and hunt some game there once in a while. That that didn't put food on the table or or keep the family farm intact. Uh, this is an aerial photo of our farm in Watkins Glen, New York. The home farm that's outlined there is 200 acres. We lease another 110 acres uh, adjacent to the farm. We're grazing about 300 acres total and. Roughly half of that currently is uh, in various stages of civil pasture development. But the reason I put this image up is so that you can see that, uh, at least here in the Northeast, our our grazing land or our open land is juxtaposed with forest land. So instead of having distinct lines on the landscape and saying, OK, this is agricultural land and this is forest land and never the two shall mix, Civil pasturing is, is an opportunity to combine all parts of our farm into uh, kind of a single productive system that's, that's um, good for our bottom line and, and also good for the land. Uh, if you're trying to evaluate an area for its, its potential for civil pasturing, this is kind of an initial checklist or quick checklist of things that we need to be thinking about. We have to have an area that has access so we can get in there with, with not just fencing materials but also with the livestock. We have to be able to check on the livestock. We have to be able to check on our fences and maintain our fences. We have to be able to get secure fencing around it to keep our our livestock in and keep predators out. Obviously, it has to have uh, both food and water. Um, if you don't have water and you can't grow food for the animals, it's it's a non-starter. It should be a productive growing site. Um, folks ask all the time, you know, can I do civil pasturing up on kind of my dry ridge top woodlot, which is growing bonsai oaks and pitch pine and um, you know I think of it much the same way as could I plant corn on a on a really poor site and you have like 50 bushel, bushel an acre corn ground and you have 100 bushel an acre corn ground and even probably 150 bushel an acre corn ground and uh, some of that is going to be profitable and others not. Civil pasturing is going to represent a significant investment of time and money. So we want to make sure that the site is going to give us enough productivity and return to pay off those investments that we're making. Um, it's going to uh, need to be an area that we can uh, thin out enough to get enough sunlight on the ground to grow enough food for our animals. It has to be compatible with our goals. And in this last point here that's bolded, the willingness and ability to care for livestock, um, this is where uh, woodland owners are that, that hear this concept of civil pasturing. They're intrigued by the idea, but then when it comes right down to it, they they like to uh, be snowbirds and head south in the winter, or it, it's just not in their their hearts or their abilities to to raise raise livestock. Um, that's not to say that there might not be opportunities to partner with a nearby grazing operation and still uh, do some civil pasture management in in uh, private woodlands. But obviously, it requires the the uh, interest and ability to, to care for those animals. And again, kind of an analogy here in the Northeast at least is that it, this may seem unorthodox to be going into wooded areas, uh, manipulating their appearance through, through uh, aggressive thinning and building fence and developing water sources, but 
uh, for those of you familiar with sugar bush management, we would expect to do much the same type of uh, beneficial thinning to promote the growth of our, our best trees, in this case uh, tap trees or sugar maple trees, and, and be putting um, extensive tubing collection systems through the woods. So there, there, is, uh, there are, um, I guess, precedents or similarities there between sugar bush management and what we would expect to do with civil pasture management. So we're going to take a break here for a moment. Uh, Sean encouraged me to throw a few questions in along the way. So we're, and we're going to do two of those questions right now. And this one says, which of the following would not be an important criteria for evaluating the potential of a site for civil pasturing? Sean, are you going to do your poll? Yes, we'll give them just a few seconds to fill out, and then I'll display the results. Okay. When I don't hear anything, I become paranoid, like I'm talking to myself. So. You let me know when we should proceed, Sean. OK. Uh, this is an easy one. Uh, we just talked about this, I think, in the previous slide. And obviously, if we're evaluating the potential of a site for civil pasture, we want to make sure that we have water access and that it's something that we really want to do or that our clients want to do. Uh, looking at the size of the timber in the area, that's, that would be a secondary consideration. Um, this can be done in relatively young uh, forest landscapes or, old, or more mature timber. And of course, keep in mind, too, the, the opportunities for creating civil pasture out of open, open pasture land. So one more question here. Civil pasturing does not draw heavily upon which of the following sciences? Think back to that second slide there. OK, very good. Looks like everybody. Uh, Almost everybody um, figured this one out. Uh, that initial slide where we said that civil pasturing is considered the triple crown of agroforestry, where we're uh, using both silviculture or forest management sciences together with animal husbandry and forage sciences or, or grazing sciences. Meteorology, of course, is important in any farming endeavor. But uh, here, civil pasturing is really that three-way formula between managing the livestock, the, the uh, food for the livestock, or the forages, and then our, our timber resource. OK, let's continue on. I want to run through just kind of since the, again, the theme of the talk today is a solution to some modern challenges. I want to run through some of these benefits or major benefits of civil pasturing that I see uh, to, to emphasize how we can be using this agroforestry system as a tool to address uh, the things that we're facing today, both as land managers and as uh, grazers or farmers. Um, I think I already illustrated how we got into civil pasturing on our own farm is really a, a, a way of dealing with some, some problematic plant communities in, our, in the wooded areas of our farm. And, and livestock can be a cost-effective and effective way to deal with uh, this, this noxious or, or excessive or unwanted vegetation. And you can see our goats there. They, they work for food. They love their jobs. They show up every day wagging their tails. and um, doing a great job there of just beating back the, the brush for us. 
I believe everybody on this webinar today understands the numerous ecosystem services that trees and forests provide. And um, there's a little quote there at the bottom, um, an estimate that our nation's forests are worth $400 billion just in terms of stormwater management. Now this slide is an exaggeration, but it to me highlights the uh, kind of the win-win of being able to um, use land for agricultural production, that's to say grazing and producing livestock, and also protecting it with a forest cover. And if we can do it with a viable forest cover, even better. On our farm, it's been an opportunity to do more with the same land and diversify our production. This is a slide from one of our uh, locust plantations on the farm where we've now done, this, this plantation is currently 25 years old. This picture is about eight years old. It's been thin three times and we've taken about $1,500 worth of blank locust fence posts per acre out of this stand. Have uh, built most of the fences on the farm through our, our, our own blank locust that we are planting back in the late 80s, early 90s. And, uh, but you can also see the animals there enjoying the uh, quality grazing early, or I guess it looks like late spring, uh, in, in the understory of that locust plantation. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about this, but there are some people that articulate this much better than I, Jerry Brunetti being one, about the benefits of a diversified diet for livestock. Animals have, um, grazing animals have a strong sensory feedback mechanism and if we make it available to them they can often pick and choose what plants and plant compounds are they're needing at any given point in time and um, those of you that are grazers I'm sure that when you turn your animals into a, a fresh paddock that has some hedgerow or some shrubs or some trees that if your animals are anything like mine, they often walk over and nibble for five minutes on, on that woody browse and then um, go about grazing. And that's because they're, they're craving or seeking things in that woody browse that they're not going to probably get as much of, at least from the cool season grasses. Back in forestry school, we were taught that edge habitat is um, a type of wildlife habitat that is viable for a broad range of wildlife species. And civil pastures can be thought of, in one sense, as extensive edge habitat. That's to say we have uh, both grassland and woodland components in any time that we introduce forages into wooded areas. Now we're creating an a important food source to help retain wildlife. Or when we introduce trees into um, more grassland type environments, now we're creating uh, structure and um, shelter and, and sometimes mass sources for that wildlife. But this, this, this is an opportunity that I think needs to be further explored by uh, wildlife biologists and, and wildlife habitat managers to see how we can uh, enhance or, or magnify the value of uh, wildlife habitat through, through civil pasture management. Civil pastures are areas that can provide a, a much needed food source in the hottest periods of the summer. This is uh, a couple images from our farm taken a few days apart back in middle of July 2011 when we had uh, 30 straight days of temperatures over 90 degrees and no measurable rainfall. And you can see that our cool season grasses in our open pastures at that point in the summer are looking pretty poor. The only reason there's grass around those cows is because that was spring stockpile that they were mob grazing at that point. But a few days later, they're in our silvopasture pasture areas that we had held in reserve and up to their backs and 
kind of a lush smorgasbord of, of uh, green and palatable and nutritious things. Civil pastures also can um, help protect our livestock from extremes in weather and extremes in temperature. As I'm giving this webinar today here in upstate New York, it's about 19 degrees outside and keeps uh, snow showers keep rolling through the area. And of course, it's very comfortable weather for cows today, but we've had an unusually cold and snowy winter. And for those uh, few days each winter when, when we have extreme wind chills and um, driving snowstorms, we move them into these civil pasture areas that we actually consider living barns. They're, they're not thinned out as much. They're mixed conifer plantations. We're not managing these uh, small scattered stands around the farm so much for, for forage production as we are just is a is a um, again is kind of a living barn or shelter area for the animals, and, and these these areas uh, are become very attractive and feasible when when I consider the alternative of having uh, some type of a roof shelter that's not only very expensive to build but then maintain. And the image in the upper right hand corner, of course, you can see cattle grazing in there. And that's, I believe, end of June, and it's you know probably already in the 80s. And um, I've noticed that our grazing animals, pretty much any day, it's above 70. Whether it's the sheep or the goats or the cattle or the horses, they're any pretty much any time it's above 70, they're seeking out shade, which is much of our grazing season. So these are kind of extensive uh, grazing areas with a with a favorable mi microclimate for the livestock. Uh, talked a little bit about the diversified nutrition, but it's also important to keep in mind that many of the plants, particularly the woody browse that we would find in a solo pasture, compares quite favorably to what we would think of as other high quality forages such as alfalfa. This is just a um, some numbers on crude protein that uh, I took from Jerry Brunetti and where he compared some common um, broadleaf weeds and, and browses to, to alfalfa. And you can see that many of those things that we would think of as like brush or as weeds compare, compare very well. And the chart in the right hand side shows uh, a bold line which is the crude protein for browse and the um, uh, the line that's not bolded below it is for the, the grass. And, and this is actually taken from the southwestern United States. But you, the, the point that I want to emphasize here is that throughout the entire grazing season, you can see that browse maintains a, a relatively higher uh, nutritional value than than the grasses. Not that that's true 100 percent of the time, but it just shows that the the, the browse components, that's to say the woody components in the civil pasture, also are are an important source of nutrition. And sometimes it's not just the browse from these woody plants, but also from the mass that they produce. Mass meaning things like fruits and seed. This is. Uh, uh, just just one example, many of us are familiar with honey locusts. It's a tree that produces a pod that has a high sugar content. This is actually pretty dated research, but um, I think it would be as true today as it was then, just showing that the value of those pods on a per acre basis can, can um, uh, supplement uh, a grazing animals diet considerably. And note at the bottom there that they were still able to graze uh, or rather produce um, pretty much the full amount of forage production underneath the canopy of those 50 honey locusts per acre. I mentioned earlier that um, we will see, I believe, increasing pressure to grow more land, um, be more sustainable. Many other parts of the world are already becoming deficient in their ability to grow their own food, so we can't be turning to somewhere else to 
put food on our own shelves and tables anymore. Uh, and there's a comment there that came from the same article that I put in red, and it just shows that you know we need to be thinking about the way that we're farming and, and growing our food. And um, I'm not going to get into that discussion today, but I think that these uh, agroforestry systems of where we're combining both forest production and agricultural production and doing it in a way that is sustainable on the landscape is, is going to be a win-win for, for all of us. And then finally, and, and this goes back to that one of those first slides where I was talking about the symbiosis and the synergy in a civil pasture system. And there's a number of phenomena such as hydraulic lift, nutrient lift, um, obviously the the uh, microclimate effect of a forest canopy, um, and then of course livestock thrown into the mix to help accelerate the nutrient recycling, et cetera, et cetera. But these these are these civil pastures are areas where um, we have these these three things working together: the the grazing animals, the trees, and the forages growing underneath. And the, and the list of benefits goes on and on and on. Um, one that I think we should be particularly interested in is woodland managers would be um, the opportunity to produce short-term income from civil pasture areas and, and also use it as a tool to address some of these things that we haven't quite figured out yet just how we're going to tackle it and do it in a way that we can actually sell to our our clients or the landowner or um, be able to um, uh, afford in, 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 on our own farms, uh, such as the control of interfering vegetation. Um, so far, I've focused many of my comments, or rather, most of the slides have come from our farm in New York, but I threw this in to highlight another benefit that I think is relevant in, in other parts of the country, and that is civil pasturing as a fire management tool. This, these are slides from our, our ranch down central Argentina, up in the Sierra Mountains of the province of Cordoba. And there, uh, we found that these, these um, exotic tree species like slash and loblolly pine, as well as some oaks and black locust and a variety of other softwoods and hardwood trees grow very well, but these are, this is an area where it rains uh, about 40 inches per year from spring through fall, and then the faucet shuts off, and we go through several months of warm temperatures and winter droughts and Mediterranean climate. and having the, the cattle grazing in these uh, forest plantations helps us manage the fire risk. And the lower picture there was a um, fire that rolled through our ranch uh, two years ago. We, we had kind of uh, escaped many times for about 20 years, and then it finally caught up with us. And you can see that those, lot, or I, I believe those pictures there, they have slash pine was scorched pretty good, and yet those areas have uh, fully recovered today, very low mortality. But that was only because um, even though it, it looks like the fire was, was very significant there, and it was, uh, this area had been grazed down to um, you know fairly tight going into the winter, which, which helped uh, reduce the fuel for the fire there. And, and then um, Interestingly enough, the, since we lost most of the grass on our on our ranch during that fire, we were able. It, fortunately, it occurred just a couple weeks prior to kind of the spring green up. But we were able to get through those critical couple of weeks by cutting off, uh, and, and it was labor intensive. But we were able to harvest uh, um, fodder from the willow and. Uh, um, poplar, hybrid poplar plant plantings around the ranch and knock it down. Of course, it all 
later stump sprouted or coppiced and, and regrew just fine, but those those species had, had leafed out and the cattle were able to basically graze on willow and um, poplar foliage for, for a week or two until the, the grass started to recover after the fire. Okay, so we're going to take another quick break and do another question here. So this question is, which would not be considered a benefit of civil pasturing? And while you're answering that, I'm going to take another sip of water. Okay, looks like everybody had a chance to answer there, and let's see what the right answer is. You all know what the right answer is. Okay, we talked about all of these except for number C. We talked about the benefits of civil pasturing for vegetation management or vegetation control, for diversifying production on the landscape, and as a favorable microclimate for ruminant animals. One thing that I have not talked about, but I'll take this opportunity to emphasize, is that uh, civil pastures should not be considered an area where uh, we consider them like sacrificial areas. In other words, we don't want to, we get into the spring mud season or an excessive rainy period, and we don't want to tear up our beautiful grass pasture, so we throw them into these wooded areas or into the civil pasture paddocks. And it's important to keep in mind that trees are long-lived and very resilient organisms. And I always tell people that are interested in civil pasturing that if you beat up on your lawn or on your garden or on your pasture, you're going to generally see the symptoms of that abuse quite quickly. You're going to see, uh, you know, the pasture become weedy or bare soil or um, just not being very productive. And in these kind of uh, herbaceous based plant systems, we can often undo the damage fairly quickly also. Uh, worst case scenario, we start over again in the spring with our garden or we back off or do some reseeding in our pasture and problem solved. But if we beat up on our civil pasture areas, we're probably not going to see the symptoms of that until many years down the road, at least not in the, the timber resource part of our civil pasture. And thinking back to that slide where I talked about the, the old paradigm of keeping animals out of the woods, that, that eroding hillside with a lot of dead and dying trees on it that's um, been continuously grazed for probably decades, those trees didn't get to look like that overnight. It took years of abuse of compacting the soil and um, it, just stressing the trees before the trees started dying or showing the symptoms of that. So. Uh, I want to caution everybody that's interested in civil pasturing into um, doing things like putting the animals in there year after year during mud season and thinking, oh, you know, the trees still look fine, everything's fine, because probably five, ten years down the road the trees are not going to look fine and then you can't really undo those, the harm that you caused. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, let's talk quickly about the keys of developing civil pasture. I'll start by saying that civil pasture is really the measure of good civil pasture is the quality and quantity of the food that we're growing for the livestock. And, and this is one of the, um, really the distinguishing characteristics that separates it from past woodland grazing practices of where animals were just kind of turned into a, in the woods and they, they browsed a little bit and there might have been a little grass or sedge in the understory, but really there wasn't an intent to grow high quality and productive forages. 
in in the civil in in these understories. So consequently, areas that uh, overstock woodlands or woodlands with these barren understories don't make quality silvo pasture. And you can see uh, in this lower left here, there's you know this is a young pool timber stand, uh, very high stocking, very little sunlight reaching the ground, and practically no forage or food for the animals. The upper right hand picture there, you can see some of our calves hiding in the in the woods. This is woods, not silvo pasture on a hot sunny day and they're even starting to uh, rub and chew the bark off uh, a young tree. However, that's it's a, a beach sampling, so I'm not too sad about that. But if if you look at around at the understories in both of these images, you can see that the animals are going to run out of food quickly. So, yeah, we might have the the timber element of the silver pasture, but we don't have the forage element. So, I'm going to simplify the, the the concept of how we develop productive silvo pastures in sort of three easy steps. Of course, there's a million fine details in there, and those details are going to vary from acre to acre and farm to farm and project to project. But first and foremost, we need to get enough solar energy at the ground level to grow these, these uh, forage plants. And I jokingly say occasionally to audiences that solo pastures are really 3D pastures. Uh, not that our open grassland pastures are necessarily two-dimensional, but in the, in the case of solo pastures, we have all these big, tall plants also growing out there that are intercepting sunlight. So we need to be managing those big, tall plants known as trees to get enough sunlight on the ground and enough quality sunlight on the ground. And there's differences, by the way, between uh, shade that comes from uh, upper forest canopy versus a low shrub understory. Uh, we're not going to get into that today, but not not all not all shade, not all sunlight is created equal. And after we get enough sunlight on the ground, we also have to create the conditions at which for which forage plants or desirable plants that we're trying to grow to feed our livestock can start to grow. If we're going in there and doing aggressive whole tree harvesting or logging or thinning in the middle of winter on a snowpack and frozen ground and barely disturbing that undecomposed leaf layer and that duff layer, then that's essentially acting as a mulch barrier for grasses and clovers and other forbs to to germinate, whether it's from the existing seed bank or seed that we went out there and spread on our own. So we need to make sure that once we got sunlight there, we also enable those, those uh, um, target plants to grow. And then once we get those plants growing, we also want to make sure, and this is where the, the, the skill grazing or the management intensive grazing comes in, we want to manage it in a way that we're encouraging the growth of the desirable plants and um, I guess discouraging the growth of all the other not so desirable plants that are also trying to capture their their share of the pie, their portion of the sunlight reaching the ground. And, and this, this is going to work different on literally every farm uh, depending on the species of livestock that we're using and um, one one thing that I'll mention at this point while it's on my mind is that silvo pasture grazing is synonymous with intensive rotational grazing. And people often ask me, well, you know, what about the soil compaction? You're putting cattle there in those woods uh, or in that silvo pasture area. The, it's, I, I, don't, I, I hesitate to throw out like a figure like saying, well, animals need to be rotated every day because sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But the way it works on our farm is with 300 acres, we have 75 permanent paddocks and animals are being shifted um, pretty much every 24 hours, every evening. So they're only coming back onto a given paddock or a given acre or a given corner of the farm about every 10 weeks. And uh, so a very important part of silvo, sound silvo, 
civil pasture management to avoid some of these, these uh, negative issues that we've seen with past woodlot grazing is allowing that adequate rest and recovery period in between each grazing or each entry. And then finally, and this is probably the most important key of all, is just thinking it through carefully, uh, starting with a, with a sound plan. Uh, many of us launch ourselves into something because it sounds like, sounds uh, attractive to us and um, or it, it, it appeals to us, our, I guess, our inner farmer or our inner, you know, tinker. And a few years down the road, we're heading for a train wreck, and we realize that we, we made a commitment that we couldn't afford or really wasn't the right thing for what we were trying to accomplish. So that's, that's where the planning part and, you know, putting on paper, uh, this isn't something to procrastinate over and, you know, wait till I can sit down for a day in front of a computer and come up with this integ integrate, uh, inter this complex plan, but rather just writing down on paper what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, why you're going to do it, who's going to actually perform the work, and let's be realistic about that one, and uh, coming up with sort of a budget and, and also um, deciding is, does this really make sense? Um, and does it make sense financially for us to be doing this? OK, uh, I think that's, um, I think we're wrapping up on the presentation here, but we got a couple more questions to go through. So this one here says that successful civil pasture creation and management does not usually include the following. everybody thinking. All right, I didn't trick anybody on this one. That's good. So we talked about these other points here, thinning to get enough sunlight on the ground, the rest and recovery, and getting desirable, palatable, nutritious plants growing in the understory to feed our grazing animals. I didn't say anything about having to do multi-species grazing, um, now, with that said, grazing multiple species could in many ways be beneficial. Of course, it comes with a cost, too. Keeping cattle fenced in to a given area can be quite simple, basically just having a single electrified strand of wire. Keeping sheep and goats in the same area, especially when you're trying to really push them to defoliate and girdle uh, noxious brush, you're not going to keep them in with a single electrified strand. So uh, people always say, well, can I do it with pigs? Can I do it with alpacas? Can I do it with sheep? Um, I think soil pasturing can potentially work with all livestock species, but there's also going to be times at which some livestock species may work better in a given situation than others. Uh, an example of that would be if you have a, if you're starting with a civil pasture area that has a heavy understory of barberry or multiflora rose or both, these are spiny, uh, thorny plants that don't die easily and that cattle would struggle to defoliate and trample sufficiently to, to kind of get those plants to die back and, and to a more manageable level in the understory. Whereas another animal like pigs, um, or possibly even sheep and goats, although I find that sheep and goats struggle much the way cattle do to defoliate these woody plants enough, but, but pigs can be encouraged 
to root up a lot of those plants, especially if you entice them with some some shell corn sprinkled around those those shrubs. They'll they'll do a good job of generally rooting those out, and you do that for a year, and then uh, once once you've kind of knocked those plants back, then you can shift to a different type of livestock. All right, another question: Which of the following statements is false? Let me interject for a second while everyone's selecting the answer. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and push out our CEU surveys. Okay. I think we're also on the last slide, fortunately, Sean. All right, and that should be opening up in a separate web browser. Give it just a second. Sean and Eric asked me if I'd be the first webinar of this series. Obviously, I expected anything and everything that could go wrong today to go wrong. But I think we've made it pretty much through the webinar without any real problems. Or did I just jinx this, Sean? Brad, this is Eric. I'm not sure if Sean is having troubles or not. You may have jinxed him. Uh, <laughs> he did push out the survey, so why don't you go ahead and just finish up with your talk here, and he'll probably make it back online in just a minute. Okay. The only thing is I can't get back to the screen that we were on. Um, you, it just popped up another web browser window, and so your yep. screen should still be open in the background. Okay. Hmm. Uh, I don't have a back arrow, and I don't have another. Go ahead and close that browser screen. window right. that popped up that says webinar portal. Okay. Or you can um, tab over to the back Blackboard Collaborate window. Should be a little icon there down the bottom of the screen. Well, I closed that, but now I'm back at the. Okay. Huh. All right. So as Sean is finishing up on that, let's uh, okay. We'll go to the answer here. The um, ah, there's the poll. Good. So the false statement, of course, here is that we don't need to really well. Rather, the the whole idea behind the soil pasture is that we're growing both quality timber and quality livestock through quality forages. So um, one thing that we would want to avoid, and, and this is a mistake that I think we see frequently on the landscape, um, regardless of civil pasturing objectives, is harvesting the best trees first. That's to say it's like pulling the tomato plants out of your garden and we leaving the weeds behind. So we really want to be growing our, our best timber trees is part of our civil pasture system that are going to appreciate and value most rapidly and remain vigorous and, and alive for a long time and continue to provide all the benefits that the trees are lending to the civil pasture system. So this is the last slide, but I wanted to point out here a couple of links that I had mentioned. The, our state forestry extension website is forestconnect.info, and if you go to that website, 
there's a publications page, and under the publications, there's a whole section on civil pasturing of resources that Peter Smolich, our state extension forester, has compiled on civil pasturing, and we're continually adding to that list of resources that uh, also has uh, archive of the presentations from the 2011 Northeast Civil Pasture Conference, and we're in the process of getting the presentations from the recent second Northeast Civil Pasture Conference that was held January 30th in Albany, New York. And at the bottom, there's also a link there to a forum that we created a couple of years ago, the civilpasture.ning.com. It's very quick and painless to join. The forum currently has, I believe, around 130 members, and it's meant to be a uh, network of people that are interested in civil pasturing where you can share your own experiences or ask questions, and instead of just one person like myself being the person that responds to them, there's the whole uh, gamut of folks out there with with uh, valuable real-time experience in doing civil pasture management that can that, that can help comment and share on, on on your ideas and projects. So I think that's it, and I'm going to go to the chat board here. Uh, I guess we have a little bit of time for questions. Sure, yeah, while we have some questions pop in, uh, Sean, go ahead and see if your mic is working, if we can hear you. Testing, testing, can you hear me? You yep. can. Yes. Okay, excellent. So we got two questions. Um, first of all, if adding trees to a pasture, how long from planting until livestock can be introduced into the pasture, and approximately how many trees per acre tends to work best? Okay. You'll note that I talked primarily in the uh, creating civil pastures out of plantations or natural woodlands today and didn't talk very much about the other direction. And I didn't talk about the other direction kind of on purpose because any of you that have experience planting trees, and I'm sure that most of the folks on the webinar do, realize that there's more to it than just digging a hole and sticking the tree in the ground. The green part goes up. Uh, when you throw uh, large grazing livestock into the mix, it, it becomes even more challenging. But the time at which you can, from which you, you plant the trees until you can be utilizing that area again for grazing is a productive soil pasture. It's, it's going to depend on many factors. It's going to depend on the tree species, or you know, are you talking about relatively slow growing northern hardwood species, or are you talking about very fast-growing species like slash and loblolly pine, thinking of the examples that I showed from my ranch in Argentina. There, we're able to get back in and start grazing those areas two to three years after planting, or we, we like to wait until the pines are about head, head height. That makes them a little less susceptible to, to cows that just want to scratch on them. But um, it also depends a lot, though, on the time of the year. We can go in there and graze them in the winter time. We can graze those areas, kind of flash graze them in the winter when the, the, the trees are kind of dormant. They don't have soft, susceptible uh, new, new growth on them, what, what we would call candle growth on pines. Um, so you also have to think about trees as a scratching post for animals that are covered with biting flies. And if, you know, again, you might be able to, to graze your, your young plantation or your silo pasture with young trees in spring or fall, but at the height of summer biting fly season, those trees are going to get mauled even if you're keeping the animals continuously moving through those through those civil pasture areas. So um, it's, it's going to be a case-by-case -case situation. It's going to depend on the type of livestock. And I guess my, my uh, advice would be to just mon monitor the situation carefully. And your, your skill as, as a grazer is going to kick, kick in, and you're going to know what you can get away with and what you can't. Next question. Are there some good examples um, 
let's see, I'm sorry, there's some good examples of how to establish a silva, uh, silva pasture and existing pasture and be able to keep usage of at least 80% of that pasture for rotational grazing. If I understand the question correctly, it's how can we establish silva pasture but still maintain at least 80% of the acreage for, for grazing? Take it, that's correct. Did I state that right? Yes. Well, if, if we're really managing a solo pasture the way it should be managed, we should be getting 100% of the, pretty much 100% of the area available for grazing. We may have to, if we're putting trees in the pasture, we may need to exclude those trees, be it rows or individual trees, for for that period of time that's necessary to get those trees up to a safe height or stage of development where they would then not be as susceptible to the to the grazing animals. Of course, if you're planting trees here in the northeast, you're going to have to protect them regardless from white-tailed deer. But uh, once those trees are, are, are beyond that kind of safe, safe point, then you should be growing forages pretty much right up to the trunk of your trees, right up to the base of the trees. If you look at the picture here in this last slide, but there were plenty of other slides I think showed this well, you can see that pretty much the entire area is covered uniformly with quality forage. All right, next question. In hardwoods, heavy grazing can often cause mineral stain and veneer in quality hardwood. How do you monitor that? Well, you're not really going to monitor mineral deposits in quality hardwood stems until you cut it down. But keep in mind, and, and I, I understand that some of these questions were probably asked prior to, well, until I got around to answering them in the presentation. But if you're again, doing management intensive grazing where those animals are uh, continuously moving throughout your entire grazing base. And uh, looking at this image, for example, um, that's, that's a mixed plantation of locusts and black walnut. Those cows are only in there for a day at a time about every 10 weeks or about four times throughout the entire year. They're not going to be compacting the soil or excessively mineralizing that soil to really change the uh, the rate of mineralization in the hardwood stems. And, and I'm not, you know, I've been a forester for, well, 25 plus years and I, I, I suspect that there's theories on what causes mineralization, but um, obviously old farm woodlots that were continuously grazed for decades, you, you see more mineral stain in the stems of those trees. But civil pasturing is something very different. It's, it's where the animals are being moved in, in a fashion that avoids soil compaction, avoids uh, you know excessive mineral deposits near the base of like a few shade trees in the pasture. All right, we have time for just a couple more questions before the room closes. So um, are oak leaves or oak acorns toxic to cattle? Okay, so oak, both the foliage and the acorns have fairly high levels of condensed tannins. And it's important to keep in mind if you start looking at a list of potentially toxic plants for your state or your area, you're going to see many plants that you would expect to find in the civil pasture area or in the civil pasture on that list. Um, really the key is that animals can often figure out on their own if we don't get in the way of what's good for them to eat and what's not. Uh, generally plant poisoning issues happen when animals are suddenly and abruptly exposed to something that they've never really been exposed before. A good example would be the pet horses or the pet alpacas that get turned out in the fruit tree orchard right after a hard frost and die of prussic acid poisoning or cyanide poisoning from eating frosted cherry or peach or plum foliage. So our, we've grazed our horses. We have thoroughbred horses. Um, I consider them sort of the coal mine canaries of the farm in our solo pasture areas for years. And they're, they're exposed to a 
large number of plants that um, you know a veterinarian would would pull out their list of toxic plants and say these these are dangerous plants and yet they they know what to stay away from. All right, and this will be the last question. I'll be posting my email address in the chat box. If you have further questions for our presenter, I'll make sure he gets those. But as for the last question, do you see lots of invasives moving back into the area once forage is established? Any notable wildlife impacts, loss of species, et cetera? Well, I wish we knew more about the pros and cons of this from a wildlife management perspective. Obviously, anything we do on the landscape is going to benefit some wildlife species and potentially harm others. Um, you know, I, again, I think that civil pastures are offering more on the same land for, for a wider range of species. In terms of invasive plants, um, really skilled grazing or skilled livestock management is key to having areas escape from us. Uh, Peter Smolage, when he talks about this, he compares it to uh, the small train wreck versus the big train wreck, and it's very important to synchronize our, our civil pasture development. That's to say the rate at which we're um, thinning areas out and letting sunlight on the ground, synchronize that with the size of our herd or the ability of our livestock to then help us keep things under control. And that careful and timely grazing of these, these recently thinned areas is going to be key to transitioning them. I showed a couple slides earlier taking about eight years apart on our farm and right after we went in and mowed everything was trying to roar back in and grow there, but then through um, a, a period of years of, of the right grazing at the right time with the right species, we were able to transition those areas. In fact, this picture here is taken uh, almost the same exact spot, again, different angle, and you can see the cows in there enjoying. This, this is taken fairly late in the fall, which is why it looks fairly barren, but they're in there enjoying the, the, the grass in those areas that used to just grow nothing but impenetrable brush forests.